Zach Elmblad, and you are watching a multi-part presentation of Borderline Vagabond, and this is chapter 16, the last one, so if you want to start at chapter 1, you should click right here. Chapter 16, Mountains. As I grew further and further on into my 20s, and the long weekends of staying out and partying started to take heavier and heavier tolls. The shotgun blast of life was beginning to lose its momentum, and I was slowly falling back down to earth. Things in my own pocket of the universe were starting to slow down, yet life in the world around me seemed to be gaining speed at an ever more frantic pace. Every year seemed to fly by faster and faster, spinning further and further out of control. I wanted to hit rock bottom with my feet on the ground. Realistically, the least wise thing I could have done upon losing my job was pack up and leave town. Any sane person would have recommended that I stock up on food and supplies for the coming hardships, but I drew on experience. Some people spend their whole lives preparing for hard times that never come. Hard times came to me early in my life and never seemed to be far off the horizon. I maintained a firm and constant grip on a vision of a better tomorrow, even if I did acknowledge a chance of failure. I can do hard times. I've had no shortage of them. Times of eating oatmeal and hot dogs. Times of saying, no guys, I can't go out tonight. I gotta save my money. I never had a problem pinching pennies, and entertaining yourself is never really that difficult. In fact, my intellect seems to thrive when I'm experiencing hard times. The immediate need to deliver yourself from point A to point B can be a strong motivator. It's only once you've hit rock bottom that you can begin to plan your climb out of the hole. You'll always find a way to get by if you try hard enough. Keep your discipline focused and ready for change, and set your sights on the horizon. With every mile I grew closer to my little corner of the mitt, the more I understood that things would never be the same. I wasn't headed back home to go to work, and I had no immediate prospects of finding any when I got there. For some reason, I didn't really care. I had worked so hard for so many years, I had forgotten how to just live. Maybe Hooper was right. I was just a dude on Earth. Maybe, in the great scheme of things, none of this really does matter. Maybe I'll never amount to a fucking thing. Maybe I'd never really be loved again. Maybe I never really was anyway. At least I knew that I loved myself. I would drive north, through Ohio, and into Michigan for the lonesome and familiar drive west along Interstate 94, home, to Kalamazoo. There, I would come back to all that I had left behind. As far away from what I perceived as the road, the dream, and the main nerve as could possibly be. I had to find a way to stop associating the concept of home with the negative feelings I felt toward the familiar and unchanging. There had to be other people I knew that had this same kind of hope I did. This same hope of building a new way of life for themselves. A hope that we could rise above this recurring nightmare of 12-hour shifts and rising prices with wage stagnation. I had worked for four years without a raise. Food prices went up, gas prices went up, my rent went up, all of my expenses increased, my wages never budged. Throughout those four years, I had worked tirelessly to create new ways of doing business, new products, new services, new infrastructure, new financial approaches, new everything. Improvements and profits continued, along with the raising of prices and the increases in responsibility. Where was my piece of the pie? What was my effort going to support? The precedent had been set for my job to require ever-increasing growth with no defined reward structure, whatsoever. I don't believe in raises, the guy told me once. I hire people to do a job, and they do it. Their job doesn't change whether profits go up or go down. Somehow, at the time, I failed to realize that I was part of the group of people he was talking about. He forgot that the people worked harder to make him more money 
with the expectation that if they worked harder, they would be rewarded in some way. If they weren't rewarded, everything regressed into reckless and dissolute repetition as they trudged along, waiting for it to be time to go home. They saw the futility in going the extra mile, towing the line until they found another job, never having the desire to improve. It only seemed logical. The rewards and incentives that I speak of don't even need to be direct infusions of cash. They can be a few extra vacation days, a trip to a ball game, or maybe a new employee discount. Anything. And, if it was given, it shouldn't be given as a display of power, but as a token of gratitude. Not to just one favored person either, but to everyone who deserves it with equal consideration. He relied on us to make him his money. Why shouldn't that effort be rewarded in some tangible way? He was expected to progress, while we were just expected to stay the same forever. We all busted ass to get the job done. We all deserved a little bit of the gain. I'm not talking socialism here. I'm talking about rewarding honest effort. If we don't reward those who perform above our level of expectation, what's the motivation to do better in the future? There's no reason for us to do anything but toe the line. I want to start my own business. I said it, almost out of frustration. I want to make money for myself. You can't start a business just to make money, you know. What? It's about meeting new people and doing good in the world. It's not about making money. That's easy to say for someone who's always relied on other people to support their lives. What do you mean? Businesses are designed to make money. You provide a good or service in exchange for money. That's exactly what's happening. You make money through business. There's no reason to start a business other than to make money legally and pay applicable taxes. All mission statements and concepts are secondary. Money is the root of all business. As I move forward in life, this story has become a polarizing topic of conversation. I own a business now. I started it to make money. Granted, I do something that I love to make that money, but the fact remains the same. I started the business to make money. Business, to me, exists as a conduit for the exchange of assets, currency, goods, and services between humans. This has been going on for thousands of years, and no one should be surprised or offended that people like to make money. I had to get home, sort out my affairs, calculate my needs, organize my wants, and assemble my lists of actionable items. I needed a reassessment of my goals. I needed to figure out what it was that I really wanted. I had always been thinking too narrowly, too immediately, or too specifically. I was looking for a route without ever seeing the map as a whole. I was leaving West Virginia, headed north on Interstate 77. I would travel through the obnoxious flatlands of Ohio for the hundredth time and across the beaten patches of Interstates 80, 90, 75, and 94 from Cleveland to Toledo to Detroit to Kalamazoo. Ultimately, the goal was to get home. I would pass through a hundred or more cities on my way through. I could make the distance seem less daunting by making secondary goals in line with my primary goal. It would seem less time-consuming if I focused on how the minor goals added up to the major one. There were a thousand different routes to take, but I chose the most direct. I wanted two things, to get home and to do it as quickly as possible. All of our problems we were bringing on ourselves. The way out of my particular jam was crystal clear once I stepped outside my standard frame of reference. Sure, I was anxious about getting a job. Obviously, it was a legitimate fear. If I had gone home and sat in my room thinking about not having a job, I never would have found one. I needed to get out and find work. I found it. It wasn't the best job, but it was a start. It was like getting from Charleston to Marietta on the way home from Hooper's. It was only a leg of my larger journey. The ultimate goal, of course, was, and still is, to make a living for myself doing things that I enjoy. Just like that stretch of I-77 through the top of West Virginia was only a small step on the road back to the mitt, so was getting that first job after finding the dream. It was the first rung on my ladder to the top, the first stone on the river crossing. 
however you wanted to put it, that's what needed to be done. If I wanted to make money, I had to get my boots on and start doing it. I couldn't sit around not making money while simultaneously being upset about it. If that's what I wanted, I had to go and get it. I couldn't wish for it or dream about it any longer. I had to make it so. That meant another restaurant gig. It's where my direct experience was. I needed experience doing other things before I could expect to make money doing them. But I couldn't expect to make a living from them at first. I had to establish my secondary goals that further progressed the primary ones. Going to an hourly paycheck, I would inevitably take a pay cut from my years as a salaried manager. I would have no hope of medical insurance, nor of a dental or vision plan, of a paid vacation, or of the way of life I was accustomed to. That didn't matter to me anymore. I understood the risks and the payoffs. The newfound satisfaction of knowing exactly what I wanted to do was enough to keep me going. I was accustomed to working 70 hours a week, all my spare time preoccupied with the terror of going back to that awful place. Working 40 hours a week as a wage warrior was going to be like paid time off. There would be plenty of time to pursue other interests on the side. Perhaps some minor frustrations, but none so horrid as the existential dread of going to the place that provides you with the means of supporting the life you can't enjoy. After a long stretch of hard work and concentration, we can begin to regain our strength and footing. We can begin construction of our own personal empires. We cast away the burden of sin from our misguided youth. We shrug off our grudges and aggressions. We can forgive those who have wronged us. We can become better people by learning from our mistakes and by taking advantage of what we have going for us. It was these thoughts of business, of the future, and of bigger and better things that occupied my mind on this lonely drive home through the mountains, a drive I'd come to recognize where time starts to blur as I move through the mists. Is it the first time I've been here, the sixth, or the twelfth? In these mountains I can see time. I can see myself existing at different points in my life, growing from boy to man as the mountains stay the same. It was there in transit, with the feeling of momentum in my gut, that I felt most alive and in control, like I was grabbing hold of the reins of destiny itself. The raw feeling of forward progression through space and time, with velocity manifest in both figurative and literal aspects. We sometimes feel as if we'll never be held accountable for our actions. Bad things eventually happen to bad people, and the good guys always win. As we progress, we feel as if we'll be able to turn the tides of karma, and that we're the only ones that won't have to be held accountable for our actions, like we somehow found a way to cheat the system. There is no good or bad, we find. Only moral choices inside the larger framework of a culture. In a cold and lonely universe, there is no great measuring stick with which to determine what was good, what was bad, why, and whether or not anybody even cared. No greater hierarchy to appeal to. Things are just things. Happenings only happenings. They carry no significance but what we give to them. However misanthropic, this is the great epistemological assumption. There is the one inevitable day where you will feel all the burdens of your past holding you down like a thousand tiny weights. Every lie, every misdeed, every false witness, all sucking the pride right out of you. All the people you've wronged will come back to haunt you in the most miserable of ways, and all the bad intent you've had along your path will one day reflect back to you in the actions of another person. We have to learn to treat other human beings the way they deserve to be treated before we can expect to be considered one of them. How are we supposed to live together peacefully on this rock in space without settling our grudges, accepting each other, and finding ways to compromise? And as for the American dream, there's a coffee table I've had since my first apartment. We painted it black with chalkboard paint, and then years later began carving things into it with a linoleum cutter. One night, shortly after Hooper abandoned his Republican hookers in Washington and was crashing on my couch, he drunkenly carved a phrase into the table with his knife, which reads, I am the American dream.
And there, near the I-77 bridge across the Ohio River from Appalachia down into the valley, I pulled to the side of the road, got out of the car, and shouted to the mountains behind me, The American dream is wherever I stand. It's all around me. I'll never be without purpose again. I saw my past behind me and the future unfolding across the Ohio River Valley. I yelled out again to the whole world, shaking my arms like a raving lunatic. I am the American dream. And so are we all, friends. So are we all. After the stories have been told and the actors all grown old, so do we too wither away with the wisdom we learned on the road. May those with the light shine brighter than the sun, and those with the darkness hide in shadows whence they come. Precious children of earth, the ever aloof and misled, we, ever inquisitive, with the thoughts inside our heads, we are the music makers, the movers and shakers, creators and destroyers of worlds, pinions driving the great gears of time. And I, dearest friends, I am the borderline vagabond, he who sought and found that he was neither wolf nor lamb. The Beginning About the Author From the lights of New York City to the cliffs on the Pacific coast, and from the lapping shores of the Great Lakes to the skies above Texas, through the spine of the Rockies, over the veins of the Mississippi, and into the heart of the Midwest, the American dream flows through the conduit of the main nerve, calling us all out onto the highways, seeking adventure, the thrill of another horizon, and the satisfaction of knowing that we're all part of something so much more magical and immense than anything we could have imagined. We hold the power to make a new world for ourselves. We should go ahead and do that. I've wandered far and wide, friends, and I can tell you that the only thing I've learned in all of my travels is that I don't know a damn thing. The best way to learn is to get out there and make the thing happen. Press on, vagabond, and keep chasing your dreams. Never be afraid to start a new path through the wilderness. For more from me, go ahead and check out ZachElmblad.com, thenewscum.org. I'm at Zach Elmblad on Twitter, Zach Elmblad on Facebook, on YouTube, and also The New Scum Fix on YouTube. The other two books I wrote are Whatever Happens Happens, a true story about coming to grips with reality, with excerpts from the diary of Stanley Lewis Slavin, and A New Way Home. My short stories are Pyramids, Paradise, and Paradigms, Opiate of the Masses, Saturday Catch, and Reckless Abandon. I have serial fiction called A Puzzle of Squares, which I'm desperately trying to rework. Recommended reading after this book, On the Road by Jack Kerouac, Breakfast of Champions by Kurt Vonnegut, Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas, A Savage Journey into the Heart of the American Dream by Hunter S. Thompson, The Electric Kool-Aid Acid Test by Tom Wolfe, Travels with Charlie in Search of America by John Steinbeck, The Catcher in the Rye by J.D. Salinger, Atlas Shrugged by Ayn Rand, Great Expectations by Charles Dickens, Drinking at the Movies by Julia Wirtz, Transmetropolitan by Warren Ellis, Charlie and the Chocolate Factory by Roald Dahl, Ode by Arthur O'Shaughnessy, and The Road Not Taken by Robert Frost. This is the music I listened to while I was writing this book. Mogwai's Mr. Beast. Coheed and Cambria's Good Apollo, I'm Burning Star 4. The Mars Volta's De Laust in the Comatorium. Fuck Button's Street Horsing. Atmosphere's Seven's Travels. Devin Townsend's Turia. Lady Gaga's The Fame Monster. Arion's The Human Equation. Neurosis, A Sun That Never Sets. 
Wiz Khalifa, Rolling Papers, Metallica, and Justice for All, Electric Wizard, Witch Cult Today, and Strapping Young Lads, Alien. Postscript. Although in essence a work of fictional allegory, this book was based entirely on an actual weekend excursion to North Carolina to seek the wise counsel of my good friend after quitting my job and ending my career in restaurant management. I view this period of my life as the end of my adolescence and the beginning of my journey into fully actualized adulthood. I felt compelled to write a book that I would have benefited from reading in my early 20s. A book that would encourage others like me to chase their own dreams. These events in North Carolina happened in the spring of 2010, after publishing my first book, Whatever Happens Happens, a true story about coming to grips with reality. I finished the story in late 2012 after visiting Dolly Sod's National Wilderness in West Virginia for Hooper's bachelor party and later his marriage in Chapel Hill. I put the preliminary editing of this book on pause throughout 2013, finishing it just before Christmas. In homage to the style of fear and loathing in Las Vegas, this story is a roman a clef, a story both of reality and fiction that correlate with one another to create a sum greater than the two parts. It is as true to life as one wishes it to be. It could also be viewed as a Bildungsroman, in that the change brought upon the vagabond is a transition between phases in his life. The interpretation of this story was out of my hands as soon as it was printed on paper. It is up to you, the reader, to decide which parts speak most to you as reality. The characters in this book are all real people whose names have been changed in respect for their privacy. We traveled, in reality, to an actual strip club where we met actual women with whom we had some very similar interactions to how this story portrays them. Cooper served as my best friend, my Dr. Gonzo, and my Dean Moriarty. His wisdom guides the vagabond through his journey. The vagabond is me, but also an idealized version of my very fallible self. Jasmine was a real person, but functions in this story as an every woman. A symbolic representation of an ideal brief encounter. An amalgamation of many of my own experiences with women, as well as a fantasy that could have easily been breathed into existence. Foxy Roxy is a stereotype but also a symbol of people in our lives that we only get to know through brief interaction and because they are important to those who are important to us. Carol, the gas station attendant, was a real person that we met for a brief exchange on a crazy night in Milwaukee in search of the American dream. Chad is also a version of me, viewed as a snapshot from the perspective of a person that interacted with me in a non-personal way as they watched me doing my job that I hated. Where this story turns to allegory is the moment we left the club, and where it returns to fact is when I walked into Hooper's apartment with biscuits and sweet tea. The conversations carried on between Hooper and I are as near verbatim as I can remember in the fog of retrospect. The dialogue that drives this story is an assemblage of years of conversation between us. Hooper found his dream in North Carolina, a fact that I remain jealous of to this day, where he found answers I found nothing but more questions. Don the Trucker was an actual stranger that gave me some extremely valuable advice at a time where I was more lost and confused than ever before. He also symbolizes the important role models in my life. A father figure giving advice to a stranger that seems down on his luck, as well as a person giving advice to someone that reminds them of themselves in a past stage of transition. I returned to the same truck stop restaurant after Hooper's wedding, only to be served once again by the wise and cheerful Sheila. To me, she symbolizes the best of what the baby boomers have to offer as they approach the end of their lives. This group knows the significance of change more than any other that followed, as well as a version of the American dream that is no longer attainable. What did happen to us on our search for the dream was far more than we could have ever imagined and the people that shared in our adventure are as an important part of the story as we are. I hope that you have gleamed some sort of insight from this intentionally arranged series of words. I wish you the best of luck in your own search for the American dream, and I thank you for your time. I encourage you to explore the world around you, 
and to strive to become a better version of yourself. May you find all that you seek. Drop me a line. I'll be writing to you again soon. With much love and respect. Zachary Kyle Elmblad.